Okay, we get started. Wow, we are actually starting around 11.30. This is like phenomenal. <clears throat> well, welcome to the prologue to Jude. Um, I'm barely going to talk about Jude. Uh, Jude is like the last little letter of the uh, New Testament just before Revelation. So if you blink, you miss it. Um, and I'm going to be doing a whole series on Jude because I think he addresses some very relevant um, misconceptions about the Bible and Christianity uh, that were prevalent in not only his day, but ours today. And he starts out saying, hey guys, I wanted to write to you about the common salvation we shared, but um, I thought it was more necessary to, uh, needful to write to you to contend earnestly for the faith, faith that was once and for all delivered to the saints. So uh, I'm going to be doing that over the next uh, many, many weeks, if not months. Even though it's a short letter, uh, there's lots of uh, bad thinking that Jude refutes. So we'll take a look at that. And I wanted to start Jude today, but right in chapter 1, there is what's known as a textual variant. The underlying Greek text, uh, there are different manuscripts. One has the word sanctified, another has the word love, and you kind of have to figure out which one it is. So uh, I'm going to tell you a little bit about how I learned how to study the scriptures. And I'm going to get a little technical. I'll wake you up after that part's over. Um, and we're going to look at some, I think, some really good big picture principles of uh, God's revelation to us. So uh, when I first, after my initial Greek courses, my advanced grammar courses, I had my first exegetical courses. And we had to write a paper. We were assigned the passage, a couple of them for the semester. And uh, you had certain parts to this paper. And the first thing you had to do was determine whether or not you had the right text. So you had to basically do what's called textual criticism. And you look externally to look at the manuscript evidence to see which was the more reliable Greek text that underlie, underlay the New Testament. And then you'd have to uh, do some internal criticism, which is what basically everyone who does uh, extra Bible study in this body does, where you see trace the author's argument through the text. Uh, that is a almost dead art and skill. Then you'd have to do a word study. You have to go back to how it was originally used in classical times in the Septuagint and you know, Old Testament translation into Greek. Then you'd have to look at how it was used uh, in common Greek and papyri. You kind of trace the, the flow of the word. And uh, then you'd have to figure out uh, what the best meaning of that word was in that context. And then you were prepared to do your exegetical outline. So uh, eventually I went on to grade that course for a number of years, and uh, I've read hundreds of papers and uh, observed how people did this textual criticism. And I came up with uh, you know, some perspective, and I haven't given it a whole lot of thought since then, uh, because it doesn't enter into a lot of things. But there are a couple significant passages in Jude where I think it makes a difference, and a lot of people have asked me about this over the years, so I thought I would give you a brief overview or introduction to textual criticism and come up with a conclusion that is the only thing you really have to remember because that's you know for three and a half decades that's all I've needed to know <laughs> but uh, it's got some good things so Jude is a bond servant of Jesus Christ and a brother of James who is also a brother of Jesus but yeah we'll get to that in future weeks and he writes to uh, people who are sanctified or loved by God the Father preserved in Christ Jesus and the called uh, Again, that's called is at the end of the sentence in Greek. It's an adjective. It's not a verb. Um, it looks like it's a verb the way it's translated here. So I'll talk a little bit about translations as well today. So I want to kind of help you understand that God has given us his word. Okay, he had spoken that stuttered. His word is designed to inform us, to guide us, to empower us regarding doing his will. And it serves as a basis for blessing and judgment. So it's a good thing to know his word. Otherwise, you're just, you know, uh, doubting in the dark. So I came across this verse uh, way before I went to seminary. Uh, probably one of the first times I read the Psalms. And I, this one, Psalm 138. Verse 2 says he's going to worship and towards the temple and praise his name uh, for his hesed and his truth. And then here's the phrase. For you have magnified your word above all your name. And there are lots of different 
variations on this in the Hebrew text as well, um, and even more variations in the translations. But the thing that I kind of understood from that in my you know, baby understanding was that God's word was really important. And then as my understanding grew, I realized that God has magnified his word, his promises, the things that he said he was going to do. He has placed that above all that he has done. Figure of speech name is put for the acts that the name performs. So the word is primary. And uh, I remember that when I was reading this, I kind of linked it to something I was reading in, in the uh, Gospels, that Jesus would do things so the word would be fulfilled. And the thought I came away with was, wow, the word is really important. And uh, purpose to learn and understand it. And actually, I went to seminary to learn how to better understand the Word of God. And uh, fortunately, I came away with a really good understanding of it. God had me there at just a perfect time. And uh, the rest is history. But the point is that God's Word is the thing that makes uh, the earth exist. It's also what became flesh and dwelt among us for a while. We beheld this glory full of grace and truth. Jesus is the Word um, incarnate. So... Uh, in bodily form. So the word's a big thing, and uh, it's really important to God's economy. And you can imagine it's something that Satan would try to thwart and distort, and uh, he has succeeded incredibly well. But uh, there's a way to find and follow truth, and we're going to take a look at that. Just my Let's see if I can get this to do it. All right. So Jesus, in his first sermon, said, truly, truly, or assuredly, I say, till heaven and earth pass away, not one little dot nor a little tittle, little, it's a little squiggle mark, normally above the uh, top left corner of your keyboard, uh, will by no means pass away from the law until all is fulfilled. And later he's going to say, his words will not pass away, heaven and earth will pass away, but his word won't. So what Jesus is saying here is even the littlest thing about God's word is significant, and uh, therefore we should pay attention to it. A little later in uh, his ministry in John 12, he said, He who rejects me and does not receive my words has that which judges him. The word that I have spoken will judge him in the last day. And this is something that our, in our day and age people just don't believe. Oh, you believe in Jesus? You don't get judged. But Jesus said... The word that I've spoken will judge you. And uh, by the way, the words I am speaking, says Jesus, are the ones that are going to judge you. So that means the word has to be understandable so we can do it. It has to be preserved so it will still be there for future generations. And we know that it's going to be there in the future and our lives are going to be evaluated against that word. So I was always a big believer in trying to figure out what was on the exams. Otherwise, I'd have to pay attention to everything. And... Uh, so we all can figure out that, okay, what God said is going to be there to judge me, so I have to make sure I'm doing what he said. A little later on, oops, what did I do here? Okay, there, I'm sorry. I'm having a little trouble with my mouse here. And this is like his last prayer before he went to the cross. He's in the garden, and he's praying and he asked the Father to sanctify those who believe in him, which I guess would be us, with his truth, and then elaborates that your word is truth. And you might have heard me say this before, the only thing the scriptures say make you holy is the word. Fasting doesn't do it, singing songs doesn't do it, praying doesn't do it, memorizing doesn't do it, uh, incorporating into your life, that's what makes you holy. So the word is really important for you to become holy and blessable and get blessed by God and fulfill your purpose for glorifying him. So it makes sense that God would preserve his word so it could be around to sanctify us, just like it's going to be around to judge us in the future. Now to ensure that that would happen... Some verses. Yeah. Uh, just before he went out into the garden in John 17, in John 16, he said, 
when he, the spirit of truth, has come, <clears throat> he will guide you into all truth. For he will not speak on his own authority, but whatever he hears, he will speak, he will tell you things to come. So this is the Holy Spirit. What is another name for the Holy Spirit? The Spirit of Truth. And what did Jesus say the Holy Spirit would do for the apostles? He would guide them into all truth. Later in the context, or somewhere in the context, it talks. He'll bring back to mind the things that I said. And uh, this is basically setting up the inspiration of the New Testament. Um, we have miracle working apostles guided by the Holy Spirit into writing the truth so that what is written is what God wanted to have written. And the Holy Spirit was given for that. So anybody who claims to be filled with the Spirit needs to be filled with the truth, guided by the truth. Uh, the truth and what the Spirit tells you will never be at odds with each other. And then later towards the uh, end of Matthew's Gospel, heaven and earth will pass away, Jesus said, but his words will by no means pass away. That means it's going to be preserved. Um, we're going to be able to have it through all generations. And despite the attempts to stamp it out, it is preserved and is accurate and is reliable and does sanctify us and do all the things that God intended it to do. It's a verse in Isaiah that his word will not return void, it will accomplish the purposes for which he uh, planned it. And uh, that's still true. God, Anything that God promised is going to happen. Otherwise, he's a liar. And also, he's revealed himself to say, I'm not a liar. Okay. Yeah, go ahead. Yeah, this is... This is telling you that the text that we've got is accurate and reliable. Okay? We can expect that it would be so because of what I just said. All right? Therefore, God makes sure that his word is preserved, it's accurate, and it's understandable by his faithful children. Preserve. If you just follow history of uh, how Satan has tried to persecute and annihilate the word and distort it, you'll be able to appreciate that. Uh, what we got is something we can accurately depend on. And here's something that I think modern people miss. It's understandable. You know, it, you don't need to be a rocket scientist to uh, understand this thing. God made it so it's comprehensible. Now, a lot of you uh, know this passage by heart. Uh, all scripture is given by inspiration of God. A uh, little freak of that is God breathed. So these are the words of God. Um, and is profitable for four things, teaching or doctrine, same word, uh, I kind of move that into the path that we should take. Uh, the word is a light into my path. We sung this that earlier this morning. Um, it's profitable for reproof. Uh, it's bringing to light where we have gotten off that path. And that's the whole, there's a lot of, not a lot, but a fair amount of scripture about the whole concept of reproof and bringing the darkness into the light so you can see what's right and what's wrong. It's profitable for correction. Shows you how to get back on the path once you've been convicted that you're off the path. And then, you know, that those are kind of initial steps in the Christian life. Staying on the path, life is a marathon. It can be tough. So discipline is the word that's used here, instruction, training, and righteousness. It's basically how to stay on the path and do what's right in God's sight. It gives us all that, verse 17, that the man of God, which happens to be the Old Testament term for a prophet, and that's the term for man or woman of God today who has the word, might be complete, brought to completion, fully furnished, thoroughly equipped for every good work. And then if you want to see what good works Timothy needed to do, look at chapter 4. I charge you therefore before the Lord is appearing to preach the word, the instant in season, out of season, reprove, rebuke, exhort with all long suffering and doctrine. Because the time is going to come when people just are not going to want to hear. They're going to put their hands over their ears. I can hear you. You know, they don't want to hear it. And uh, when they don't want to hear it, um, they don't have ears to hear, and they are no longer disciples. Peter described a little bit of this process. Um, he said, we have the prophetic word confirmed which you do well to take heed to as a light that shines in a dark place till the day dawns and the morning star arises in your hearts. So Peter was with the uh, James and John in the Mount of Transfiguration. They actually saw um, Jesus and Moses and Elijah glowing. They saw glory. They saw the glory of the Son of God. 
And the thing that is interesting is they are not just saying, this is our experience, but he ties it back to the word that God planned and prophesied. Um, so they would interpret even miraculous modern day events in light of what the scripture said. Um, and we do well to heed to it. Knowing this, that no prophecy of scripture is of any private interpretation. Um, in other words, it well, there's a scrutiny of uh, group interpretation. Prophecy never came by the will of man, but holy men of God spoke as they were moved by the Holy Spirit. A uh, better word is conveyed or borne along. So the Holy Spirit, just like in John 4, guided the uh, people who were writing so that what was written was what God wanted. It was not dictation. Uh, if we do some things on uh, the canonicity of Scripture and how it came about, uh, it, you know, that's one of the, the false theories. But he used the personalities of each person, and you can see their styles reflected uh, in their letters if you pay enough attention to them. So God has given us this word to guide us. We can rely on it. It is trustworthy, even though people will cast lots of doubt on it. The first textual critic who was going to criticize the text and say it's got problems was Satan. And you see him in Genesis 3. Eve says, well, this is what God said. And Satan says, God has not said. And she's there, oh, okay. Because <laughs> the fruit looks really good. I want to eat it anyway. So uh, Satan has been behind a lot of this, and uh, he knows how to use the scripture. Um, Jesus' major defense against Satan uh, was scripture. Um, when Satan wanted, Satan wanted Jesus to worship him as a shortcut to um, glory, which God wanted Jesus to have, he says, get behind me, Satan, and then he quotes the scripture. Notice he doesn't quote chapter and verse. Uh, you shall worship the Lord your God, and him only you shall serve. So Satan's there going, ah, foiled. And then he brings Jesus to Jerusalem, sets him on the pinnacle of the temple, and said to him, hey, all this is mine, I can give it to you. Uh, oh, that was the previous one. Uh, if you're the son of God, throw yourself down from here. For it is written, he shall give his angels charge over you to keep you. And Jesus said, Oh, well, I guess if that's the scripture, then I guess I should do it. But Jesus knew the scripture is better than Satan. And he said, uh, <clears throat> by the way, it's uh, been said, you shall not tempt the Lord your God. And then Satan went, ah, foiled again and left. So in the uh, Ephesians 6 passage, the uh, it's actually corporate armor, the offensive weapon, in dealing with Satan's attempts uh, is the sword of the spirit, which is the word of God. That's the, just like this word is the only thing that sanctifies us, the word is the only thing that skewers Satan. So, uh, you know, he doesn't fear our chanting, our prayers, our singing songs, or whatever. Uh, but he does fear the word of God, and uh, will do whatever he can to distort it and disrupt it. If you look at the backstory of some of the people I'm going to be talking about, particularly Westcott and Hort, uh, you will find much of the occult and demonic in their lives. And these are two guys who totally perverted the word of God. And I might mention some of it, but you can deal more on your own. So if he was the first, that means um, everyone that follows him, uh, everyone who comes after him is going to follow in his footsteps, and they're going to cast doubt on the word of God. So there are two approaches to the scriptures. You have, we do not have the original copies of the scripture. I don't know if you knew that. They're not in a museum somewhere. Uh, what Peter and Paul and John wrote, um, Matthew, Mark, and Luke, we have copies of it. So when I do my Western Civ class, I'll show you know, a list of 10 classical authors. And from when Plato wrote his Republic to our copy of it is a thousand years gap. And we only have a few copies, handfuls of copies. And I had just given my classes assignments in these various books and realized that you know, the thing that you're reading uh, is just like a handful of copies, a thousand years difference. Uh, for the New Testament, we have thousands of copies, uh, you know, 100 years or so different from the original. 
It's more accurate than any ancient text. Now, some of these texts agree on almost every point. Uh, for the most part, there are errors. They disagree. And someone said, you know, there are 400 pages in the New Testament and the textual variants that might be significant is are half a page. And none of them, you know, today affect any major doctrine. Back in the old days, uh, the evil guys would use them to try to get rid of truth and succeeded in some spots, but eventually got corrected. So no major doctrine of the Christian faith is at all in doubt or dispute as a result of variance in the extent of the existing text. So uh, most of the stuff that you have been taught, if it's accurately taught, is pretty worth believing. So one of the problems that exist in so many areas of life is the concept of academic expert opinion. You know, what do I know? Those guys are smarter than I am. Normally they say those guys are smarter than me. They didn't pay attention to the grammar courses. Um, and we basically fail to take our role as uh, priest of God and uh, heirs of God's truth, and we just defer to the experts. So if you were Satan, where would you go to disrupt the whole church? You'd go to the academic institutions. And someone has said there's been no higher academic biblical institution that uh, has existed faithfully for over 100 years. All the Ivy Leagues, with the exception of Cornell, were started to train ministers. Now, it's like the farthest thing from their mind about training ministers. So expert opinion has moved from, back in the 1800s, the majority text, which has the majority of text, to the minority text, which has the minority of text. Okay, so majority is the major bulk of scriptures. There's like 5,000 down here. Uh, 5,000 manuscripts um, that are in agreement with the TR, which means the Texas Receptus. The Texas Receptus is the text of the King James Bible, and it means the text we received, so just kind of what came down. And a really smart guy who uh, didn't really buy into, he was a little, I wouldn't call him an agnostic, um, but he, he was not Catholic, he was not Protestant. Uh, well, depending on the time, he might have been one or the other. But he basically put together the, the Texas Receptus, and it has you know a few issues, but uh, it, it's the basis of the King James Bible, which is the, really the Bible God has used to change the world. Okay, I am not a King James only person. Okay, um, the King James is wonderful if you understand Elizabethan English, but if you can't read, you know, Wadsworth and Brown, yeah. You know, some of the ancient, uh, not ancient, the, uh, Milton, some of the older uh, poet, poet, poets, you need a modern translation. So when I teach my survey courses at New York School of Bible, when I was dean there, I would use the NIV because it's very readable. But I tell people, if you're going to study the text, you want to use uh, the New King James, and you eventually want to get back to the underlying Greek. And it's amazing. If you have graduated from high school, or if you can read Harry Potter, particularly if you can read Harry Potter, you can understand a few Greek words you need to use. If you can figure out what those spells are, you've got the mental capacity to do that, right? Uh, and instead, it's like, oh, man, it's only asked me to know what word of Greek. Um, so the majority text is also known as the uh, Byzantine text type, because Byzantine was the Constantinople. That was the capital of the uh, western half of the Roman Empire. Uh, it basically was intact, speaking Greek until like almost 15, 14, 50 or so AD. Um, and it, there are a lot of texts that were copied there and distributed. And one of those was the text that was used to translate the King James Bible. The minority text is based on a handful of texts. The two most famous are called A and B. <laughs> uh, and there's like three or four others. And they are um, the, um, I always get this confused. The A is, uh, I have it right down here. One of them is this uh, one that was found in the Vatican, and the other was found uh, in a waste paper basket in 
at Mount Sinai Monastery. So those is called Sinaiticus and not Sinaiticus or you know whatever. And those are the two texts that um, some people of academics have come along to. These are the important ones. Okay, so we're going to do something called internal and external criticism. Uh, you look at where the things are distributed. This was the argument, and I wish I could draw this out for you, but I'm not that skillful, that helped me understand this. So if, if you kind of step back and look at how Christianity spread, it starts in Jerusalem, goes up to Antioch, and then Paul spreads it through his churches, and then some of it goes south, moves in Syria, uh, goes over to Italy, and then eventually gets up to England, and in England, we have the King James Bible that's translated, and that was used by God to evangelize the world. But if you look at the manuscripts back like 200 years after Christ, you can find the majority text manuscripts from Spain and the far west all the way over to India, up north towards Germany and down south to Egypt. It covers the entire gamut of the world at that time. Uh, the, the other ones are found, were done just around Alexandria. And I remember uh, sitting with some doctoral students at Dallas, and they were saying how they were had been read, reading a couple of uh, dissertations which demonstrated what horrible scribes the um, Alexandrian scribes were. Because if they didn't like something, they just cut it out. They had an anti-supernatural bias, and their Bible, their texts are a whole lot shorter. We'll see that down below. And people think, well, the stuff that we found in Alexandria looks better and it looks older so it must be the right one and uh we're going to look a little more deeply at that to see the distribution it goes like this if i have something in spain that matches something in italy you can assume that you know let's say i had a little misspelling okay and both of them have that same misspelling you can assume they have a parent that they was copied from that existed which was used in spain and used in Italy. And then if it also matches the one that was used over in India, you've got, well, this, this is probably a pretty original thing. So this distribution, but people say, but those things are so old. I mean, are, are, you know, are not that old. You know, they're, they're like 300, 400. But um, what happens is in order for it to have spread that far, it had to have a parent ancestor before that. It was like the generation before. And then for that to match up, it had to have one before and four, and you build it back up. And when I was at Dallas, one of the professors down there that uh, has actually spoken at Big Apple Chapel, St. Hodges, um, I had given his life to, with another guy called Art Barstead, putting together the New Testament according to the majority text. The funny thing is, this is the stuff that was done in 1600, that's what people believed. In 1700, that's what it believed. In most of the 1800s, that's what people believed. But then at the end of the 1800s, these two guys came along that were the Anglican Church that really disliked the King James text. They had a very strong Catholic influence. The Catholic Church didn't like the King James text because, you know, it was getting uh, converts away from Christianity, uh, Roman Catholicism. And then they edited it and said, oh, this is the right text. So the family trees, the, the distribution, um, are what's known as external evidence. Internal evidence is when you read a passage and you see whether it makes sense or not. And I'm going to show you that very much when we go to uh, Jude. Uh, you know, some of the textual decisions are so obvious in the scripture that I am amazed that people don't see that. Of course, some people see it, but others don't. Westcott and Horton, the two bad guys, uh, had a dictum that older is better. And it would kind of make sense until you realize that the text up north were worn out and the climate didn't preserve it. It's written on paper, you know, papyrus, paper, um, and it doesn't last as long. People keep using it. And have you ever seen a person with a Bible falling apart? You know, people said people have a Bible falling apart, normally have lives that aren't. Uh, if you use it a lot, it wears out. So if the churches are using it, it wears out and then it gets replaced. The ones down in Alexandria, the climate is dry. It preserves it. The climate in the rest of Europe, it's wet and moist. You know, the paper deteriorates. It gets moldy. You know, it gets you know, bacteria into it, and it, it falls apart. Ones that are preserved in a library for a thousand years, well, they're going to look really good. 
Um, so the two texts, the uh, one from the Vatican and the one from Mount Sinai, are written on vellum. It's animal skin. They're really expensive. It looks really pretty. It's very impressive. But it's bogus. And we'll see why in a few minutes. Looking good, normally equivalent with being bad. <laughs> and these texts that are the minority texts were not used. They actually found them in a waste paper basket at uh, the monastery at the base of Mount Sinai. That's, and these monks valued the word of God. But this text was like so corrupted that they just said, toss it. And they used other ones. And then these other guys come along and said, oh, we found this. It must be the right one. So the majority text is based on 5,200 existing manuscripts. So MSS is an abbreviation for manuscripts. And they are in agreement with the Texas Receptus, the one that the King James was based on, part of the majority text type. But wait, there's more. There are versions of the Bible that exist that are like, I give you the years of these, uh, 157 AD, 147 AD, or 120 AD for some of them. Um, the uh, minority text uh, is about 350. So these, these things are actually older. These are not just little manuscripts. These are versions of the Bible that exist that are older than these two manuscripts that Westcott and Hort are promoting. And not only do you have some of these, you got 18 to 25,000 copies of these versions. What does that tell you? This was being used by God in the life of his people. When the Vatican sat on the shelf for over a thousand years, and none of that was, wasn't being used by God by anybody's life. The one at the waste paper basket at Mount Sinai wasn't being used by God in people's lives. God was using the scripture. Now, one of the things that helps you put this in context, when they started putting together the canon, that means the uh, books that they considered canonical or valid in the New Testament, had to have some requirements like being written by a miracle performing apostle or their associate. And... Um, had to not be contradictory to the rest of the scripture, which is why James had a hard time getting in because they didn't understand James. See the other truth basis. Understand that argument. And then it had to be used by God in the lives of his people. So like Paul wrote four letters to the Corinthians, but only two of those were preserved. And I guess God wasn't using those. So clearly God was using the majority text in the lives of his people for you know, a thousand and a half years or almost 2,000 years before these uh, others were discovered. Oh, now we have the real word of God. Oh, really? What, 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 what's been going on for the past couple thousand years? We don't, we don't have it? So there are all these copies of the majority text um, from Spain to India. Uh, it's, a, it's a Syrian text. Old Latin Vulgate. This is what God used to um, evangelize Italy. An italic text that was written. The, the Waldensteins are a fascinating group. They have some of the oldest texts and I'll probably mention them when I do the false teachers. Uh, they have one that was used to evangelize the south of France, uh, another old Syriac, Armenian Bible. There's actually still 1,244 copies of this version still in existence. So clearly God was using the majority text everywhere. Okay, now the minority text. Okay, so um, A is the one that was found by Mount Sinai. B is the one that was found in the Vatican. And they say it was written on fine vellum, which is tanned animal skins, and remains in excellent condition. Um, it was found in the Vatican Library in 1481. All right, that's just, about the, just before the Renaissance. And in spite of being in excellent condition, this text that Westcott and Horner are saying, oh, this is the real text, omits um, all but four chapters of five cha four chapters of the book of Exodus. It misses creation, it misses Adam, uh, you know, Adam and Eve, it misses the fall, it misses Abraham, it misses Joseph, it, all that, all of Genesis, boom, not there. Um, it misses a bunch of Psalms, 30 or so, it misses the end of Matthew, it misses the Pauline pastoral epistles, that's Timothy 1, Timothy 2, and Titus, which tells you how to run church. It wasn't there. Uh, it leaves out the last chapters, last half of the book of Hebrews which has some really significant uh, verses that um, kind of do damage to 
uh, Catholic concept of the Mass and sacrificing Christ every day. And it leaves out all of Revelation, which talks about the real kingdom of God. And then these guys come along and say, oh, this is the real original text. Unbelievable. It's seldom used because of so many omissions, alterations, errors, additions, deletions. Um, what does this reference say? Uh, and for one thing, uh, Venaticus and uh, Sinaticus, Sinat, uh, whatever, disagree with each other over 3,000 times in the Gospels alone. So you have these two texts that you say are really authentic, and just in Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, there are 3,000 times where they disagree. How could anyone in their right mind say, this is the right text? Maybe they aren't in their right mind. So uh, A was found in the Sinai trash can, B was found in the Vatican. It was discovered in 1475, and it really wasn't uh, published and made available to 1845. Um, it is not older than the earliest versions of the Bible. All right? So these guys are about 4th century. So that, that where the centuries work. From 0 to 100 is the 1st century. So the 2nd century is from 100 to 200. So if you want to find out where the 4th century is, you could kind of uh, back one, and it's in the 300s, mid-300s. So you have ones that are 150 to 180. Uh, Syria was the Antioch capital. That's where the Christians were first called Christians in Antioch. Uh, and just look at the ages of these things. Way older than um, the minority texts, and they all agree with the majority text. You know, spelling errors, uh, you drop off a little word here, you miss. Sometimes they would uh, have someone dictating, and there'd be an error of hearing, so you'll have a variant. Um, sometimes when a scribe was copying, if two sentences ended in the same phrase, they would skip one because they thought they just got that. So one of the things in textual criticism is uh, you want to be able to have which one explains the other one, and then which one is more difficult. The one that can explain the other, and the one that is more difficult is usually more correct, which is, you know, people have argued whether or not those are accurate dictums to uh, textual criticism. Uh, being able to do the internal argument is far better. So these ancient versions are like 200 years older than the Greek manuscripts. Um, and yes, A and B are older than other Greek manuscripts, but for anyone to suggest that they are more accurate is absurd. The guy said, it's like saying you will find the greatest truth being preached in the old, oldest cathedrals you know, of Europe or whatever. So if it's old, it must be right. No, if it's old, it's uh, an existing. It might be because it was never used, because it was no good. And they've demonstrated that they're no good. Uh, you know, there are guys who gave their life to this. Uh, Dr. Scrivener is one of them. Uh, Cincinnaticus is covered with alterations, brought in by at least 10 different revisers. So you had the text, and then they kept revising it. So it's not a pure original text. It's one that is revised, sometimes by 10 different revivers, revised, revisers. Some of them systematically spread over every page. Uh, others occasional limited to separated portions of the manuscript, like a footnote. Uh, many of them could be contemporaneous with the first writer, so the first writer could have done it. But the greater part of them belong to the 6th or 7th century. So we're look, now looking at something that was edited or revised at 550 AD. Which would you believe, something like that or something that you have this wide distribution of from like 200 AD? So if you believe older is better, then you'd go for the versions that are older. Um, the Westminster Dictionary of the Bible, uh, page 624, I normally don't quote these folks, but uh, the Vaticanus was available to the translators of the King James Bible, but they did not use it because they knew it was unreliable. So back in the day, they had this one, they examined it, and said, this stuff is garbage, and they didn't use it. That should tell you something. Uh, Dr. Martin, uh, B exhibits numerous places where the scribe has written the same word, you know, twice, or phrase twice in succession. Uh, in the Gospels alone, uh, Vatican leaves out words or clauses no less than almost 1,500 times. In the Gospels alone. Uh, it bears traces, another quote, of careless transcriptions on every page. Smythe says, from one end to the other, a whole manuscript has been traveled over by the pen of some scribe about the 10th century. And there's a 
footnote there where you, or a website there where you can kind of find some of these quotes. Or you can just type any of these quotes into the Google bar. Okay, so. Westcott and Hort did their work around 1881. In 1932, 1952, we have papyri. Uh, that are part of a collection that was found that had, like most of Paul's letters and some other stuff. So it wasn't just a little fragment, it was a pretty significant discovery. And uh, they number them 45, 46, and 66. And look at the dates of these 150 AD, 175, 150. And this is a quote Since the discovery of the papyrus, proof is available that occasionally the Byzantine text preserves a reading that dates from early witnesses. Do you see the bias in there? Uh, these guys are in accord with the majority text, and but only occasionally, oh, they might preserve a reading. They, you know, might, so even if, a, you know, once in a great while preserves a reading, it basically shows that opposed to the uh, A and B from Westcott Hort, that the uh, majority text is superior. Um, I'm amazed to the degree to which Academic people have bought into the fact that Westcott Hort is um, superior. So, uh, over the years, I've had the uh, this tasteful pleasure of interacting with lots of academics. <laughs> I have been one, <laughs> and my opinion of them goes down daily. And I began to kind of formulate, you know, 30 years ago, the understanding that most Academics are idiot savants with an emphasis on the idiot. <laughs> they know one thing in depth and detail because their doctoral dissertations require them to find one thing and know everything about that one thing to the exclusion of everything else, and then they can't put it in its context. So they tend to be you know, more sensor rather than intuitive, uh, and they don't want to look outside that field because A, their advisors don't want them to, and B, they'll find something that uh, conflicts with their findings. So almost in every field, from you know, literary to science, uh, people will take anything that disagrees with what they um, are finding and sho shove it under the rug. And I've actually had quotes where people say, that's what we do. We put things under the rug. My perspective is truth is that which explains all the facts. And if you can't accommodate all the facts, you don't have truth. And unfortunately, uh, the atmosphere has become so politically charged that even if a guy is interested in truth and comes up with what's true, he doesn't mention it for fear of being ridiculed as being you know, backward or out of date or worse thing, worse fate, not on the party page. <laughs> so if you, uh, there's an article I came across in my uh, email feed this week of uh, some uh, professors, good guys, that were kind of really concerned at the degree to which academia has become politicized. And no more is any discussion of an item allowed. So they put together some bogus papers, like someone examining the uh, sex habits of 10,000 dogs in a dog park. Right? They wrote up these papers, they submitted them to journals, and uh, the journals published them saying what fine scholarship. And they did a handful of these, and anyone that basically condemned uh, you know, white males was uh, you know, published with raving reviews. Then they kind of came out with the fact that um, this was all bogus. We made this up. But the journals all published it and said it was good stuff. They weren't interested in science, they're just interested in um, promoting a political agenda. Uh, I remember my sister was getting her doctorate, it was, it was really, you know, it's on the flavor components of wine chemistry, but it was all politicized. She, she almost didn't get it because uh, she said something that offended her uh, dissertation chairperson. So um, the, the two things about the uh, bogus things published in the journals, um, number one, the journals were not chastised, but the professors who perpetrated this were considered the bad guys 
because they expose that the emperor has no clothes on. And then the second thing is not one of those journals lost any subscriptions from any of the universities, even though they're publishing fake science, bogus science, and uh, that's the academic world today. I remember uh, reading a lot when my kids were debating uh, on uh, you know, climate change stuff and the whole evolution thing. And one of the quotes I came across on uh, creation uh, answers in Genesis is something like this. Uh, majority of biology professors do not believe in evolution, but they can't say that because, you know, carbon dating and uh, the evolutionary thing, it's just bad science, bad statistics, it's bad everything. But if they say that, they will be ostracized, forced out, and will get absolutely no research grants. So we now have this thing where the academics are people who are just trying to enhance their reputation to get their grant, selling their soul just for their next grant. And it's just tragic. And the populace, it gets dumber and dumber and dumber So because it's the educational process. And as a result, they can't you know, basically think for themselves. They can't evaluate evidence. They really don't have the basis for saying, well, it's either this or that. It can't be both. And the populace basically says, oh, whatever. And I uh, remember riding, riding the bus. I'm, you know, one time I had to stand at them, kind of overlooking much of the people's shoulders that I'm looking. They're just playing games or doing crossword puzzles or checking sports figures. And I know there are lots of people who will tell you the statistics on every team approaching March Madness. <laughs> they, you know, I remember we had, when we were doing debating, there were kids who would spend all this time memorizing baseball scores and statistics. Like, why give yourself to that? And then, you know, let's go a little further. So you might not be a, you know, crossword puzzle or sports statistics nut. Uh, the whole people, you know, the, you think about the math, I listen to financial news. So it's all about the number. What's the number? What's the stock number? What's this? What that? And then if you want to have the people that you know, check out at grocery stores, it's all about the shows and the celebrities. It's like we, we fill ourselves, our minds with just junk. And we do not have the ability to read and write simple things, nor communicate. Um, so when it comes to, ooh, papyrus, uh, manuscript, uh, that sounds like difficult stuff. Uh, I'll just trust my pastor to tell me. And uh, unfortunately, pastors, uh, we shall see when I start going through Jude, um, are not always the most honorable critters. Um, and I don't think it's uh, any deliberate deceit. I, I think it's more, um, it's what the market wants. We don't want someone who's going to make us uncomfortable. We want someone to tell us that we're okay just where we are. So that brings up the King James only people. Um, as I mentioned, I am a fan of the majority text. Uh, I will, all my research uh, tools basically start with the King James Bible. And I recommend that people use the New King James. Now, the New King James cleans up the Elizabethan language, but it also makes departures from the King James text. And the majority of the times where I've seen the King James changed, the New King James has been wrong. Bible society, these people who are translating the scriptures into other languages for people to be evangelized, moved from the majority text to the Westcott Hort minority text. Uh, I don't know how many years ago, 10 or 15 years ago. And I know the inner workings of two different Bible societies, and the liberals have taken it over and moved it away from the text. Now, the King James only people will say, Oh, those other texts, they deny the deity of Christ. No, they don't deny it. They just kind of diminish it. Uh, you'll see they deny heaven. No, they don't deny heaven. They just kind of diminish it. They'll remove references to heaven. They'll soft pedal Jesus' divinity. So, you know, it's, it's stuff that's uh, not direct distortions, but eventually you feed a lie, and it just keeps growing and growing and growing. The King James people, only people, actually do themselves a disservice because they have some childish arguments. Um, and uh, I guess they kind of are outraged over the truth being distorted, but they fail to realize that, um, yeah, the, King, the Texas Receptus is not infallible. The thing that only that makes it more infallible 
is exegetical outlining, tracing the author's argument. Regardless of what the background text is, you can have the ability, and most of you do have this already, to trace the author's argument through a text. And when you're faced with the meaning of two different words, or you know which one is it, um, you can basically make an intelligent decision as to why it's one over the other. Which brings me to the last point, I think. Someone sent me this. It was something that was being taught, promoted, sent around by a member of the NIV Translation Committee. Okay? So when we first started Big Apple Chapel, we had a gal uh, who was pretty literate. And uh, she learned how to study the Bible and then started referring to the NIV as the noticeably incorrect version. <laughs> and um, yeah, for the, you know, nine out of, eight out of ten times, uh, if there's a decision where they depart from the King James, they've made a mistake. A couple times they are brilliant. The guy who did uh, Thessalonians, uh, the beginning of the chapters of Thessal First and Second Thessalonians, the, the best work I've seen in terms of correctly translating the pronouns. It was wonderful. Um, but for the most part, they've tried to smooth things out, and they smooth things out just like the scribes of old, based on their estimations of what should be there as opposed to working with what is actually there. So he gave this example where, uh, let's say, pretend you're a first-year Greek student, and uh, your assignment is to make a translation of uh, Colossians 1.12. So uh, I think he's a little southerner. So uh, you basically translate it word for word looking, using, a, using a dictionary. Uh, and it comes up with, made y'all sufficient into the portion of the inheritance of the saints and the light. And then he basically says, well, good. You've shown your professor that you remember dictionary definitions. Okay. And most of you know that knowing a dictionary definition is meaningless. You need to look at all the dictionary definitions to figure out which one the author actually meant. Then he goes on to say, you're going to have to decide what sufficient means. Uh, bag, uh, which is Bauer, Dingrich, yeah, should be B-A-G-D, or Dingrich and Danker, uh, glosses it, presents it as, to cause to be adequate, to make sufficient or to qualify. And here's the kicker. However, qualified to me sounds like somehow now we deserve it. So I would never go with that option. This is the head of a translation committee. This is where people use their theological bias to come up with interpretations. And there his Reformed theology says, oh, we can't deserve anything. So anytime he's going to have a, a passage of scripture that thinks we deserve it, he's going to change it. And uh, even though the NIV actually kind of did a decent one on this one, he says, much better are these. Uh, NRSV, I really dislike. New Living basically bears almost no resemblance to the original text. When I was down in Florida, I visited a number of churches and they had these translations up there. And I said, wow, that's a really cool translation, but like I've never heard anything like that. And then I said, what's this NLT? So I looked it up, uh, the New Living Translation. Living Translation is a paraphrase, a pretty extreme paraphrase. And the new one is even you know, further from the text. Sometimes they get it right. I, and I, you, you've seen on my outlines, I will bring in an outline, uh, in a translation from something else because it says it really well. But there's this bias, not only in what the text is, but in the ways they translate it. So the corrective, is you need to learn how to study the scriptures. Otherwise, you're at the mercy of translators who aren't inspired or led along by the Holy Spirit. All that being said, uh, the scriptures that we have do serve as a guide for truth, a guide for doing what God wants, and uh, you can study it and make sure that you understand it. Okay, questions on what I set up above or any of the ones down below? When you say ultimately Satan is behind the energizing, you guys bring disruption, disruptive text or whatever? Yeah, let's look at question number two. How could two unused, highly amended, inconsistent, and inaccurate texts obtain prominence among very intelligent people? It doesn't make sense. Satan has done that. They want to be accepted by the smart guys. And that's how seminaries go liberal. 
um, I had the blessing of not being raised in a uh, biblical church. Uh, why was it a blessing? Because when my, you know, rational processes fully kicked in, I was able to look at things and say, that's logical, that's illogical, that can't be right. I don't know what is right, but I know that can't be right. But if you think about almost everyone who gets to a position where they are um, teaching at a seminary level or translating the scriptures has grown up in a church. They have heard what the text is supposed to say from some guy up front who basically just thrown together a sermon or saying what someone else has said before him. And I can say this with a lot of truth because I used to grade sermons and I realized people are saying things that can't possibly come out of the text. They are just quoting the party line. And then I couldn't really ding them for quite quoting the party line. Uh, but I know that their thinking was not going on in their head based on what they were writing. So who is it who's going to take these people and get them to buy something that's really bad? Who was it who was able to get Eve to buy something that was really bad? The master deceiver. So it's all over the place. So yes, Satan has been alive and well. Um, have you ever heard, oh, the Bible is just full of errors? Yeah, well, where did that kind of come from? Uh, I used to respond, okay, well, show me one. Uh, I went through Daily Truth Base. I don't think I came across any errors or inconsistencies. Some things that look difficult on the top, but by and large, they could be explained. And there might have been one or two things, you know, an error of numbers or, you know, stuff that is relatively. If you look at how the numbers are actually written in uh, the ancient languages, it's easy to confuse one to the other. So those those are no biggies. Um, if you correctly understand the text, there's not, they're resolvable. Um, it's kind of like, Either the things are resolvable in a way that maybe isn't satisfying to us, but is not following any laws of logic, or we are left alone in the dark in this world. That's really what the choice boils down to. So my thing is, if I don't understand something, it's not wrong. I just don't understand it yet. As opposed to other people, oh, I don't understand that, so it's got to be wrong. And they have become the judge of the scriptures rather than letting the scriptures judge them. So do you think God would hide the correct version of Scripture on a Vatican shelf or a monastery trash heap for a thousand years? <laughs> How are people going to get sanctified? How are people going to know the path? How are people going to basically prepare themselves for future judgment? If that was the case, they wouldn't be able to do that. Um, number three, how could a common disdain text or translation, i.e. the King James, be derided for centuries, yet used by God to change lives in the world? Maybe it's more right than people think. And, you know, why are educated people more cognizant of uh, all the stupid stuff as opposed to things of eternal value? Um, basically, those around them, you kind of fall into what, you know, at work, nobody talks about what the scriptures say during March Madness. <laughs> and last one. Do you judge the scriptures and conform them to your opinions about life? Or do you let them judge you and conform your life to them? It's really what our task is, because these scriptures are going to be there in the last day to judge us. And what we're going to see when we get into Jude is people basically go against the scriptures and teach others to do the same, um, which will be the case for us, because we're going to understand what God directly said. Yeah? So they can um, that scripture, right? Mm -hmm. So Yeah, I would, I hate to say this, yeah, so Satan uses scripture, does that mean that someone who is a Christian can still be in the word and be deceived? Uh, when I was dean of New York School of the Bible, I would weekly have people come up to me saying that they believe God wanted them to do something. They were taking courses in a Bible school, all right, and uh, I just had this, uh, because I was teaching multiple survey courses, I would just be able to flip. And it was like the spiritual gift of flipping <laughs> to a page which showed scriptures that were directly contradictory to the thing that God told them to do. And this would happen, you know, every week for years. And these are, you know, the cream of the crop of most churches who want to really understand the scriptures, totally deceived about what the scriptures say. So, yeah, that. So you can definitely get people off track. Yeah. Mm -hmm. 
Uh, those are dates for the, for the copies. So the first one should have AD, and then all the ones that follow um, should flow from that. Just to save space, I got rid of the AD each time. It also has things like the Shepherd of Hermes. It even has the Didache, which was a kind of a manual. So they put in apocryphal books as well as uh, some early church books. So um, it, you know, is not an accurate reflection of the uh, original text. Good point. Last call. So you don't have to worry about, you know, just look for the majority text. And if that one doesn't make sense, then you look for, you know, an alternative reading. But for the most part, it kind of makes sense. Um, you know, I, I basically, when I was in seminary, I hung around a group of guys who uh, were all exegetes. Most of them were doctoral students. And uh, they were all pretty firmly majority text people. It's funny, I read couple articles and normally when I start reading an article I can tell like in the first couple paragraphs just like when I read the term paper uh, the guys bias where they're coming from and I'm starting to read this thing and I don't look at the authors because I don't want to be biased I look at what they say and I realize oh yeah, this is a bogus argument you know, they're basically using argumentation about methodology and you know, all this other stuff and they actually come out for the um, Westcott Hort text and I'm thinking okay who is this idiot <laughs> It was the guy who taught me Greek grammar. <laughs> I mean, how, how could you do that? You know, the guy is really good on the little nuts and bolts stuff. Really, really good at that. But somehow he has gotten sidetracked. I have like three professors that have been sidetracked uh, into wrong thinking that you know, I had personally and no one should for them. Um, five of them. Well, it keeps going. <laughs> keep thinking. <laughs> that have kind of departed from what they once believed. And you know, these are guys who have multiple doctorates, and they just you know, get seduced. That's how Satan works. Six of them. <laughs> I'm just, you know, I'm just a, right, I better stop thinking this otherwise. And, and I went to, you know, I'm still really fond of Dallas Seminary. Um, and I'm not even sure if they're still at Dallas, but uh, it's just sad. Okay, let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you that you have revealed your word to us in a way that we can trust it, rely on it, and understand it. Uh, Father, may we do so and obey it for your glory. Uh, may Satan be bound in his ability to confuse and uh, deceive people uh, regarding your truth. Uh, and may people embrace the truth and make it part of their lives for your glory's sake. We personally commit ourselves to this task in Christ's name. Amen.